Hello, everyone. Great to see you here today on day two. So I have a question for you. Is everybody having a great conference? Yes. There is. There is such a vibe at this conference. There is such an atmosphere. There is so much collegiality and friendship and hugging, and it is just wonderful to be part of it. So thank you all for making that. Uh, now, everybody has a job at their table today. Um, you know, I, I've come to many of these dinners and every, these lunches. Every time I come to these lunches, I always seem to end up sitting at a table, coming in at the last minute, sitting at a table, and uh, not knowing anybody at the table. So your job at every table, please, is to make a new friend, okay? Get, got that? Everybody at the table, before you leave, don't have to do it now, but before you leave, make a, make a new friend. Okay. But let me have your attention for a little minute here, because, hello. <laughs> okay, attention please, if I could have your attention. This is Okay, there we go. Terrific. Okay, so. Um, just to get us started here, I want to reflect on one thing, a very important thing, which is we've talked about it before, we need to mention it again now, collective action over the course of the pandemic. During the pandemic, we had orchestras in Texas rallying support from Republican Senator John Cornyn as the lead co-sponsor of the Save Our Stages bill. Florida orchestras weighing in with Republican Small Business Committee Marco Rubio to secure eligibility for PPP. And California orchestras, including her own hometown orchestra in San Francisco, urging support from Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Your action together, quite literally from coast to coast, helped to create the bipartisan support that made the pandemic relief possible. So that is a big thank you to all of you for your support in that. And talking of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, I'm very pleased to introduce a welcome video from Speaker Pelosi to the conference. Hello, as Speaker of the House, I am pleased to bring greetings from Congress to the League of American Orchestra 77th National Conference. Thank you to President and CEO Simon Woods, the Young Life Philharmonic, and the Association of California Symphony Orchestras for hosting this important gathering. As our nation's orchestras move forward together after two difficult years, House Democrats are proud to work alongside you because we know that the arts are essential to our society. Uh, they allow us to laugh together, cry together, be inspired together, to forget our differences, and to come closer together. House Democrats are grateful for the beauty and vitality of the orchestras you represent across the nation, including our dazzling San Francisco Symphony. That is why we delivered historic funding through the American Rescue Plan to our cultural institutions as to, as to weather the pandemic. And it is why we look forward to continuing our shared work to keep the music playing for generations to come. Thank you and best wishes for a productive conference. Thank, thank you, thank you, Speaker Pelosi. Thank you to all the politicians across the aisles who support the arts in this country. We appreciate it. Now for some music. Uh, the League's annual meeting and luncheon has been generously supported by Contrapunctus Bar Baroque Chamber Orchestra Ensemble. They are represented here today by Executive Director Raymond Jacobs and Consultant John Schwerbel. We thank Contrapunctus for their support. Contrapunctus is an up-and-coming LA-based Baroque Chamber Ensemble comprised of remarkable young musicians who all hail from the Colburn School of Music in Los Angeles and the Juilliard School in New York. They are led by concertmaster Hannah White. And today they'll be playing a special Baroque set including music by Gemignani and Vivaldi, culminating in a performance of Vitale's Chacon in G minor by one of the fastest rising stars in classical music today, Aubrey Oliverson. And uh, we hope you enjoy the performance. We're going to invite you to just pause your conversations um, and pay attention to these wonderful young musicians. And uh, we hope you enjoy the music, and we'll be back with the program afterwards. So please welcome Contrapunctus.
well, <laughs> it's not every day that I get to play for so many people who are so involved in this incredible art form that we've all devoted our lives to. So it's quite the pleasure for me. And I'm grateful for Contrapunctus for having me. Um, it's an honor to be on stage with all these musicians, these amazing musicians. My name is Aubrey Oliverson, and we are going to play the Vitali Chacon for you all. So being a Chacon, it is very, it's quite repetitive. Um, it's a theme in variations, and the theme comes back about four or five times. But I find that within the nature of this repetition, it is quite meditative, and I find it to be deeply moving. So I hope you all enjoy, and after the Vitali, we'll finish it off with a little Vivaldi.
Thank you very much to Contrapunctus. Did you enjoy that wonderful music? And Aubrey Olison, wonderful talent, wonderful, wonderful, great, great music. Okay, I want to say a note of thanks to the National Endowment for the Arts. The NEA, as you know, we value them deeply because of um, leadership provided for the NEA for grant making, research, convenings, and in fact, critical support for this very conference. So we're very grateful to all, all our friends at the NEA, to Anne Meyer Baker, Court Burns, Anna Nikiforiak, and all of the music division for the guidance they share with us, and particularly with you, with orchestras all the year round. So quick um, round of applause, if we may, for support for the National Day. The arts. And it gives me um, very great pleasure now to, to introduce uh, from the National Endowment to the Arts, Sonia Tower, the NEA's um, Director of Strategic Communications and Public Affairs, who brings long experience in music, public policy, and the cultural sector to her leadership at the agency. And it's a, a great pleasure to welcome Sonia. Oh, she's behind me. Well, wow, there you go. It's a great pleasure to, I was looking over there. It's a great pleasure to welcome Sonia to the stage. Sonia, thank you so much for joining us, and we're happy to hear from you. Thank you, Simon, for that lovely introduction and for the invitation to join you and say a few words on behalf of the Arts Endowment. Um, firstly, I just need to say uh, bravo to uh, Contrapunctus. Uh, that was really extraordinary, so it was put me in a very good mood. Uh, bravo also uh, to um, the board and staff of the League for your extraordinary work in mounting this conference. Uh, despite many challenges that we know you faced, and many thanks to the Los Angeles Philharmonic and the Association of California Symphony Orchestras for your leadership in serving as the conference uh, host. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Sonia Chala Tower, and I'm delighted to be with you today. Uh, I'm also happy to convey warm greetings from our chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. Uh, she sends uh, warm regards to everyone here and her thanks for, for everything you do every day on behalf of the arts. I feel very honored to have been appointed by President Biden to head up communications for the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'm also feeling very energized by the appointment of our new chair and inspired by her vision for the future. More than anything, I want to tell you how much I appreciate your being here today. And especially, I want to thank you for your commitment to music, to your staff, to your orchestras. You have an important role as leaders and stewards of music and culture in your communities. And we are grateful for your leadership, especially over the past two years. But you're here. Isn't it wonderful to be together again, to see friends and colleagues, and to hear live music together? We, we needed it. So congratulations for being here. Uh, just to update you on how the uh, Arts Endowment is doing, uh, over the past two years, the agency was in maximum telework mode, carrying out our full range of programming, going virtual, uh, like many of you, with our public programs such as Jazz Masters, Heritage Fellows, and Poetry Out Loud. In 2020, in addition to our regular grants, the NEA distributed $75 million as part of the CARES Act to assist the creative sector. In 2021, in addition to our regular programming, the Arts Endowment developed a new grant program and distributed $135 million in relief funding through the American Rescue Plan. The money was granted to state, regional, uh, and local arts agencies, as well as uh, directly to arts organizations uh, to help the arts and culture sector recover. To support employment, operations, and facility costs, supplies, marketing, everything that you need to be in business. Uh, these were operating funds and they didn't require a match, which is unusual uh, for the NEA. We don't usually do that. Um, but it was important to, to provide some relief. Uh, orchestras, I'm happy to say, uh, received um, 24, there were 24 orchestras that received grants, 
totaling approximately $2.55 million. So congratulations to all of the orchestras uh, that received that funding. Um, the, uh, the additional grant support that we made to states and uh, uh, regional arts organizations and local arts agencies, we want you to be on the lookout because many of those were sub-granting programs. So they received funding and a lot of that funding is rolling out now. So whether or not you received a grant before, please be on the lookout for what the locals are doing um, with this funding because uh, you, might, you might be able to um, apply for those opportunities. In our most recent grant cycle for FY uh, 2022, the agency awarded 101 grants to orchestra to orchestras through the uh, grants for arts projects and challenge America categories and that totaled 2.27 million dollars so um, we know that uh, that uh, there's a lot more need out there and we are doing everything we can to make sure we can provide assistance even with the massive effort on the part of the NEA in distributing these rescue funds we know that people and organizations are still hurting the last two years have been tremendously difficult canceled seasons and programs temporary and then long-term closures music and performing arts organizations were among those in the cultural sector most impacted by the pandemic. You know you lived through it. However, while this was an extraordinarily challenging time, out of this devastation came innovative thinking by institutional leaders. Many arts and cultural organizations, including many of you, rethought how to deliver programs with organizations expanding and stepping up their digital audiences, uh, their digital offerings to reach new audiences. Now, I, I want to touch on a few points that I feel sure that Chair Jackson would want to share with you. Uh, the Chair has been talking a great deal recently about the role of the NEA and that at its best, the NEA is not only a grant maker, but it's also a convener, collaborator, catalyst, and thought leader. It is a national resource and a key partner in building healthy arts and cultural ecosystems. She also believes that the arts, that arts organizations are a critical component uh, in a healthy arts ecosystem. It is you, the creators, who can make the idea of all Americans living artful lives a reality. She is frequently asked about how the sector can recover from the last two years. What she says is that while we have seen dimensions of the sector devastated, we have at the same time been reminded of the power of the arts and encouraged by the prospect of a recovery fueled not only by what has been, but what can be. As we step into a new season, hopefully bolstered by what we have learned and what we are learning, she extends an invitation to you to not just snap back to what was and consider how together we can work together to build a more inclusive and equitable future for all, work that is necessary to reaching our full potential. In closing, I invite you to consider what your role is in contributing to a healthy and equitable arts and cultural ecosystem uh, that makes artful lives possible for all people. Please know that the NEA is honored to be uh, going forward together with you on this journey. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Doug Hagerman, board chair of the league. Uh, thank you, Sonia, for your comments, and thank you for your support. Please convey our uh, thanks to Chair Jackson. Uh, now we get to one of my favorite parts of the day, one of the highlights of conference, which is the presentation of the Gold Baton Award. And this year, we're presenting two awards. Having not presented one last year, uh, we'll have one presentation today and another tomorrow. The Gold Baton is the league's highest honor and has been presented to the, to the most eminent people in our field. I'm so pleased that we're presenting the award today to my friend and colleague, Jesse Rosen, whose leadership I was fortunate to see up close during three plus years when Jesse and I worked together as, with him as CEO and me as board chair 
I learned so much from Jesse, and I can't think of a better honor uh, it, for his service uh, to this field. Presenting the award will be Alex Lang. Alex is the principal clarinet of the Phoenix Symphony Orchestra. Uh, he's a leader in our field in so many ways. Many of us were inspired by his keynote remarks at conference a few years ago. Uh, and Alex's latest project is the Black Orchestra Network, of which he's a co-founder. Please welcome Alex to present Jesse's award. Good afternoon. I'm honored to be here today to present Jesse Rosen with his gold baton. This is a legacy award presented for a body of work. And in thinking about how to talk about Jesse's body of work in these brief remarks, I found the answer in two places, in the room and in the question. So the answer is always in the room, of course, and that's literally so in this case. That's because one of the most valued things the League does is convene people in ways that matter to them. For me as an orchestral musician, that's the whole thing right there, convening people in ways that matter to them. To some degree or another, that's what we're doing right now in this room. We do that around things that are designed by the League, sessions at the conference, learning programs like the Essentials of Orchestra Management, we do that, convene in ways that matter, around things that we create ourselves alongside something the League designs. So that's side meetings, conversations, relationships, connections. Things we value that a League convening helps happen but can't design. So in terms of Jesse's body of work in this regard, I did a back of the envelope accounting and came up with this. 11 three-day, 11 annual three-day conferences totaling hundreds of sessions, including pivoting to the first virtual conference, 11 midwinter managers meetings, four cohorts of the Emerging Leaders Program, the development of virtual convening and learning spaces like League 360 and The Hug, Tub, excuse me, 10 cohorts of the Essentials of Orchestra Management, collaborative nationwide projects like the Ford Made in America Commissioning Consortium and the National Alliance for Audition Support, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I don't know about or didn't think about. This was, after all, a back of the envelope accounting. That's a body of work that's about facilitating literally thousands of people coming together to learn, to strengthen networks, ways for people, this body, these bodies to advance their work and the work of orchestras in meaningful ways that are both designed by the League and its leadership and created by its members. That's a significant body of work, Jesse. I said the second place that I found the answer to talking about Jesse Rosen's body of work was in the question. Critical Questions was a regular column Jesse wrote for Symphony Magazine. It was the first place I met Jesse, actually. Not in person, virtually, but through the printed page, actually, which dates me, I know. I read critical questions, sometimes agreeing, sometimes, as the young people say, SMH, shaking my head. <laughs> I got introduced to thoughts and thinkers from other fields, museums, newspapers, for-profit, non-profit. It was the conversation I was looking to have. Jesse asked us, are we really in a position where we can afford to lose entrepreneurial musicians artistically and organizationally? Can we afford that loss of multifaceted talent? Jesse asked, what does Ferguson mean for orchestras? Wither the canon? Why don't we talk about music? How might orchestras nourish the musical potential of everyone associated with them? How would artists repertoire and programming change if principles of diversity were elevated to the highest priority? Do our existing values, frameworks, practices, and organizational designs support the continuing growth of the orchestral experience? In terms of why I think this matters, let me quote a book I was reading getting ready for this, The Art of Powerful Questions. It says, a paradigm shift occurs when a question is asked inside the current paradigm 
that can only be answered outside it. As we enter an era in which system issues often lie at the root of critical challenges, an era in which cause and effect relationships are not immediately apparent, the capacity to raise penetrating questions that challenge the current operating assumptions will be the key to creating positive futures. And so, the reason we're here, to honor a body of work that includes, among many other things, sustaining and growing the means and mechanisms that invite and allow people, these people, this body, to convene, and a practice of driving yourself and the field to search for better questions. And on behalf of the League of American Orchestras, please join me in welcoming Jesse Rosen to receive his gold baton. Yikes, that was really nice, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. You can come down to Chapel Hill anytime and read that again. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd like to say is just to acknowledge and uh, celebrate the League's incredible staff and board. They are the instrumentality through which the League has done and continues to do everything it does. And to a person, they are smart, energetic, loyal, hardworking, and above all, what they really care about is orchestras and being as much help to all of you as they can. So thanks to all of you for all you've done to support the work of the League and, and my leadership at, at the League. Um, also, I, I've had the benefit of a lot of mentors uh, over the course of my career, and there are too many uh, for me to name, but I think I can get away with a couple because they have something in common that nobody else does, and they are both uh, predecessors of mine. Um, the first is the person who probably has answered more emails, telephone calls, calls for help, calls to come and lead our retreat and help than anyone on planet Earth, and that is Henry Fogel. And Henry, are, you must be here, so hello Henry and thank you. And, and the other person is, um, is Kathy French. And Kathy, I think by far, hands down, the, the most courageous CEO that the League has ever had. And I'll tell you why, why I say that. Um, today's, this, this week's conference, if you look at the content, it's really quite extraordinary. And any of us who've been around for more than a few years know that we are a different field than we used to be. And um, the work we do now has antecedents big, important antecedents that were surfaced in 1991 when Kathy convened extensive consultations with the field and the upshot was a set of guideposts for how we move forward into the future. And guess what was in those guideposts? Become more relevant to your community's program, more work, uh-oh, oh, more work by living composers, embrace technology, and tear down the barriers that have made orchestras a whites-only art form. That was 1991. Well, it's wonderful we got where we are. And I say this because uh, we can celebrate the progress, but you know, it took 30 years. Next time the league points in a direction, don't let it be 30 years. You know, kind of get, get with the program a little more quickly. Um, there's actually another person uh, I can mention who was a league predecessor, my dad. He actually ran the league. He was its executive director in 1996. He only lasted a year. He had to get out of the heat and take the easy path and became CEO of the Pittsburgh Symphony and then the Philadelphia Orchestra. And um, he, uh, he taught me a lot of things. I learned a lot from him, and uh, he's never far from my thoughts. 
Um, so enough with the past. Um, in terms of things I've learned in the last few years, every important thing I've learned, I've learned from people, some combination of 40 years younger than me, not working in orchestras, and being black, brown, or Asian American and Pacific Islander. Now, that's not to say anything against everybody else, but I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. It's, it's, it's a long story, I'm gonna try to tell it really, really short. Some years ago, we had our Essentials of Orchestra Management seminar right down the road at USC. We had our first day, everyone was feeling good. Everyone was getting to know each other and feeling all close and connected. And the, the day ended in the afternoon, a session on diversity, and in a session where the faculty talked about um, their careers and what a great field this was and how open and welcoming and nurturing it was. And we all left feeling great, went off to do whatever we did in the evening. About 10 o'clock that night, I got a call. I forget who called me, but apparently the class was mighty unhappy with what they heard from our faculty. And so I got the faculty together and, and we said, all right, let's drop tomorrow's plan. Let's just, let's just talk and listen. Let's, let's see what the class has to tell us. So they said, you know, um, diversity, you might have thought to have some people whose lived experience could help us understand this better instead of a whole bunch of old white guys. And on the field and, you know, what it felt like to be in orchestras, they said, you know, we get what you're saying, but you have to understand it doesn't look that way to us. We're on the outside looking in. And so we see a field that feels kind of impenetrable and you've done nothing to help us figure out how to actually navigate that. And it's not that orchestras aren't supportive and nurturing. I mean, all of that stuff is true and all of us have benefited from that. It just depends, you know, what your vantage point is. You know, where, where are you standing? And none of us knows everything, and more of us know more. And so, you know, I'm, I'm relating this story because I think that um, those of you who are in positions to influence how we come together to think and to work um, need to spend a lot of attention on creating those spaces so that those voices can be heard, different voices than you've heard before, and voices that can be squeaky. And to those of you who possess those voices, don't stop, turn up the volume, and you know, do like John Lewis said, and make, make good trouble. And I think that's how things are gonna work to help us keep going forward. So that's what I think we all need to do. And I would say one more thing, that there are things that uh, have been important to me outside of the league over my career, and one of them was a long association with the American Composers Orchestra. I was very happy to be part of the search committee that uh, recruited our current executive director, Melissa Nahn. And Melissa, are you here? If you are, stand up so we could recognize you. Melissa, Melissa? Not here! Oh, all right, well. we'll... Okay. <laughs> well, that's a good proxy. And, and the other is the, um, the Gateways Music Festival. And I'm very proud to have been a board member of theirs for the last two years. And Lee Kuntz, their executive director, is here today. And please uh, welcome Lee. And, and finally, it's Lee Giving Day. And even though the development staff didn't remind me like they usually do, give. Give to the league, support the league. It's wonderful to see everybody, and thank you. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Jesse. Thank you for everything you've done for our field. I'm thrilled to announce that uh, in honor of Jesse's service and in honor of this award, the League has commissioned a new work by the wonderful composer Tanya Leone in Jesse's honor. The work uh, will be premiered in Albany by the Albany Symphony led by David Allen Miller in January, on January 14th and 15th in Albany. Uh, I hope you will all be there. I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our volunteer award winners. You see them up on the slide. Um, if you are a recipient of one of these 2021 awards, please stand at this time so we can thank you.
There, there's a lot of hard work in these volunteer associations and the sharing of best practices about how they're getting their work done is really crucial to us. So now I'm going to open our annual meeting and we're going to go really fast and get some business done. So first I'm going to give you a little overview of our financials for fiscal 2021. You see it on the slide there. With a budget of $7.2 million, we ended with an operating surplus of $362,000. Uh, incidentally, our budget does include our regranting programs. So of that $7 million, $860,000 was money we took in and sent back out. The league's assets were $11.7 million, including an endowment, reserve funds, and a change capital fund. You'll see on the next slide a simple analysis of our income and our expense. And the point here is that fundraising is critical to the league, uh, and as well as the fact that the vast majority of the money that we raise and that we collect from dues goes to programs, not to overhead. Uh, next, I want to show you our, our five new board members who are up for, real, up, up for election at this time. We've added five outstanding new, new directors. First is Judy Dines, a flutist in the Houston Symphony. Afa Dworkin from Michigan, who runs the Sphinx organization. John Lofton, a trombonist with the L.A. Phil. Incidentally, Judy and John are part of a cohort of five orchestral musicians who represent that perspective on the league board. In addition, Michael Mayton, who's an orchestra leader from Little Rock, Arkansas. Rob McDonald, board chair from Cincinnati. So at this po point, I would entertain a motion to elect these five individuals as directors of the league. Second? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Our, uh, we also have a slate of, of uh, directors for re-election. Uh, you can see them on the board. This is part of our core team of, of directors. Uh, and uh, I will entertain a motion to re-elect these individuals. Is there a second? All in favor? Thank you very much. Um, on the next slide, you can see our slate of officers for the coming fiscal year. Myself as chair. Uh, Aaron Flagg and Alan Mason as, as vice chairs, uh, Chris Dorr as treasurer, and Melanie Clark as secretary. The league board will be electing them at its upcoming meeting. We also have some retiring directors. Uh, these individuals retired from the board this year, and I want to thank them for their service, and especially want to note the retirement of Lowell Notaboom. Lowell served on our board for 20 years and was the chair of the league for eight years or so. Uh, so we uh, recognize Lowell's service today as well. During the year, we elected three new emeritus directors, uh, Lowell, Steve Parrish, and Ann Parsons. We're going to talk more about Ann and her extraordinary contributions in a few minutes. We also uh, want to thank our outgoing ex officio directors. These are individuals who represented their constituencies on the league board through the past year. And now we're going to show the incoming uh, ex officio directors. I want to thank those who have finished their service as well as those who are just starting. We expanded the group of executive directors on our board a few years ago at Simon's suggestion so that the uh, voice of, of uh, uh, leaders in the field from the administrative side would be well representative on our, our board. We continue to have a diverse and inclusive board in, in my judgment. 18 of our 54 directors are people of color. That's 33%. So that concludes our annual meeting. Thank you for bearing with me during that whirlwind. And, and, and now it's over to Simon for his remarks. Quick, quickest annual meeting in history. One board chair always said to me, if you have a long annual meeting, then you're in big trouble. So obviously we're not in big trouble. Uh, thank you very much, Doug. I, I want to do something that I didn't do earlier, but I want to just welcome everybody joining us on the live stream today. We had a few technical problems yesterday. I hope those are solved. I hope that you are with us and uh, you're able to enjoy this meeting and we're able to enjoy the music. Thank you very much to all those of you joining remotely. Uh, first thing I want to do, Doug already touched on it, 
But I want to thank the league staff, and this is personal. Um, you, you know, as amazingly enough, I only met some of them IRL a few one, a few months ago. Uh, we were I started in, in 2020 and was working for a lot of time with people I'd never met physically in person. But this is a small and mighty team, and. Um, you, you know, the, the passion that they put into not only pulling off a conference which is disproportionately large to the size of our staff, but also the passion they have for orchestras and supporting you 24-7 through the year. It's, it's a really, truly remarkable group of people. And I'd like the league staff, not all of them are here because some of them are working in places across the conference, but all those league staff members who are here, please stand and be thanked. And they're all, they're all in the back there. And, and I particularly want to call out our extraordinary Washington, D.C. team. That's Heather Noonan and Nedjan Lee, of course. Between Heather, Heather and Nedjan, they have an astonishing 41 years of service to this field. And that 41 years um, is really 41 years of practice for the pandemic, because it, this is when it really showed up, that experience to um, steward through the Shuttered Venues program more than $260 million in federal relief funds to 340 orchestras in 48 states. And then the part that you don't see, literally helping orchestra, or orchestras one by one, individually, orchestra by orchestra, and many of you in, in this room will have had those experiences, helping orchestras navigate the incredibly complex processes for the various forms of, of relief. So Heather and Nedjan, please stand and, and, and be, be thanked by us. And in fact, Heather, don't sit down. In fact, um, as Heather said to me today, our work is never done. Indeed, it isn't. And uh, needless to say, Heather has a point you can all take action on today. So here's Heather to give you one piece of uh, homework. Thanks so much. Uh, you know, Nedjan and I are always showing up in your inboxes saying, it's time to do something, we need your help now. And it, it's kind of glorious to get to do this in person with you. So um, you have done so much to advance awareness of the needs for the arts at the federal level. And I know you're all working in your communities to do the same. So as you're meeting here at your national conference, your city mayors are having their national conference in Reno. It starts tomorrow. And I wanted to make you aware that they will vote on resolutions that are recommendations to Congress on how the Congress can support their communities. So these are mayors saying what their communities need. They have a resolution, a draft resolution, that was advanced by, was requested by arts organizations. Um, and it's led by San Francisco Mayor Breed and Los Angeles Mayor Garcetti asking for more help in COVID relief for the arts. This is called resolution number 93. I know you all have your mayors on speed dial. So the goal is to get every mayor possible endorsing this request. We know the long tail of COVID means more help is needed. This is one way that we can get there. So whether you have a chance today or in the coming weeks even just to establish a close relationship with your municipal leaders, this is an opportunity for federal relief still to come and local relief to support your orchestra and your community. Thanks again for your partnership. So thank you, Heather. Thank you. And so um, when I joined the league back in 2020, many people said to me, wow, what a challenging time to start this role. Um, and although, yes, indeed, there were many challenges and have been many challenges, it's also been an incredibly invigorating time. And one of the reasons for that is that you have told us over and over again through this period that the league's support matters is, is more vital than ever. And we are truly, all of us at the league, energized by that energized by that sense of purpose. So I do want to take just a moment in my CEO's report here at the annual meeting just to, to kind of um, flip through a few important things that happened in the league during the last year. During the, um, uh, during the past year or so, of course, the pandemic dominated the work 
Um, but the, the volume of how of people we've brought together for learning in solidarity has been pretty remarkable. Over 170 constituency meetings, 36 webinars with 11,000 registrations, 150 orchestras taking part in new data projects, 150 grants to member orchestras and 30 convenings for those grantees. And we fielded, and this is what I was referring to just now, we fielded more than 2,500 requ requests for individual assistance um, for government, for the, the, for the government to media and also for, from, through our knowledge center. But although we've been very focused on um, pandemic support, we've never stopped thinking uh, during this time about the critical future issues, such as training the next generation of leaders from the field. So during the, uh, the hiatus, we reworked the Essentials of Orchestra Management program, and I'm so uh, excited that it's coming back this July in partnership with the Juilliard School. I think we've got a slide for that. Um, with over 80 applicants for 30 spot spots, it was the most competitive field we've ever had for Essentials of Orchestra Management. So this really continues to be one of the most beloved and impactful things that we do, we do at the League. And what's really exciting is that we're now starting something which has been kind of muttered about for a few years and now we're doing it, which is to start a League alumni network. Uh, an alumni network. We have hundreds and hundreds of people, many of you in this room, working out in the field who've been through the various league extensive training programs. And we now have an alumni network. We had the first meeting of it yesterday. It was a very high energy, great meeting. Um, and we're incredibly happy that it's going to be led by, by Scott Faulkner, who is also faculty director of Essentials this year. And this will be a way of providing another network of support for people as they leave our programs and go on to work in the field. So we're very happy about that. I want to turn uh, for a moment um, to our work around equity, diversity and inclusion, which you know is um, absolutely a central value for us. And uh, as I think every, you know, everybody knows, um, we've been working very hard on this in, in, the, in the past year, but nothing was probably more important for this than this Symphony Magazine article written by Aaron Flagg. Uh, anti-black discrimination in American orchestras. And I'm absolutely thrilled that this award, this was, was recognized with an ASCAP Deems Taylor Virgil Thompson Award this year. It's really not an overstatement um, to say that this article, with its content that was so shocking, should not have been shocking, but was shocking to us, um, it was such a wake-up call. This, this was a landmark moment for our field's commitment to equity and inclusion. And Aaron, um, I just like you to just uh, be thanked for that 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 incredibly important article. And since then, that was really the impetus for us to dramatically ramp up the energy we've thrown at providing the resources um, to orchestras to advance change. And this feels like some of the most meaningful work we do now. And just by the, on the basis of how many times you're downloading these reports, we feel like it's hitting the spot. But of course, we always are interested in your feedback and different things that you would like to have from us. And we're now going to the next level because the next level is not just support to support the equity, diversity and inclusion work, but to measure it based on the assumption that you can't change what you don't measure. Um, and this is a major new important initiative for the League. Just last week, we announced the new Repertoire Diversity Report in, in, in collaboration with Rob Diemer and the Institute for Composer Diversity. And we had a fantastic session this morning. Those of you at that session, a great, great discussion in a very, very full room about, um, about uh, composer diversity. And this feels like you know, the beginning of a, of a new journey of actually measuring this repertoire as it changes in the years to come. And then we'll be following that shortly um, in a few months this fall with an update of the 2016 repertoire, um, excuse me, uh, uh, demographic report. And it's amazing how many times the demographic report gets quoted in newspapers and journals and other places around the country. So we need to update it. It's coming and, and that will come shortly. And what's perhaps even more important is that now we're going to take this new commitment to data and to reporting it. And we are going to be reporting it every year. We're going to be reporting it on a, on a longitudinal basis, which is not only about our field being transparent about um, how, where we are, but it is also about holding ourselves collectively, publicly accountable to the change that we know is so overdue and that so many of us are working so hard for. So annual reporting is going to become a very important part of this. 
And lastly, I want to just mention, um, talking about uh, perhaps the most um, you know, impactful aspect of what we do in equity, diversity, inclusion, and that's the Catalyst program. Catalyst program, um, thanks to um, very generous support from our friends at Mellon and uh, Angel Foundations, was launched in 2019. And you know, there's already been. You can see the slide here. That's that's the that's the 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 catalyst pro the first catalyst program. There's already um, been between that this program and the new program on the next slide, the catalyst incubator program. That's more than 70 seven zero orchestras who are thanks to regranting able to get this critical work started, or if it's already started advancing it. And I, I just want to say I am full of admiration for every single orchestra on this slide. It's not easy work. It's not meant to be easy work. But the way that people have thrown themselves at it and put themselves on the line to grow and learn and make your organizations um, you know, more inclusive together is, uh, is a very, very uh, important piece of work. And we're very happy to, to watch that uh, latest phase of that. So it's been an exciting couple of years. I could, you know, when I when I wrote these remarks, I um, I left a lot on the cutting room floor. Trust me, uh, there's so many things we could say about. But all it, suffice to say, we're working incredibly hard to support you. Um, we want to be here for your needs. We're we're doing a strategic plan right now, which is designed to do a deep dive into what the most effective use of our time and work is. Um, and we're always pleased to hear from you. So please never hesitate to reach out and tell us how we can serve you better and more effectively out in the field. We're very grateful for every single uh, piece of insight we get from you. So lastly, in finishing, I want to thank, thank Doug and the amazing league board for their, for their support. Um, our board is a very, very special and wonderful group of people, very thoughtful deeply, deeply caring about the whole sector, and also very forward-leaning, a very forward-leaning board, which pushes us hard to do our best work. So uh, I really want to just take this moment to thank all the, mem all the members of the League Board World. We really, really, truly appreciate Doug and all your colleagues. Thank you. So... Now it is uh, my very, thank you very much, that's now, that's my remarks completed. Now it's my very great pleasure to introduce my very, very dear friend Jennifer Barlament for a very important message. Hi Jennifer. Hello everyone, and it's great to be here with you. Uh, just wonderful to be able to nerd out on orchestra management stuff again together in person. I've really missed that. Um, so I'm going to cut to the chase first, it's League Giving Day, and then let you know that I've got about two minutes worth of things to say, which is just about enough time for all of you to get out your phones, take those cards off the doodads in the middle of your tables, take down the QR code and make a gift in the meantime, which is the goal of all of this. So it's an honor to have the opportunity to advocate on behalf of the League, an organization that is near and dear to my heart. Decades ago, the League helped me discover this career, which is really much more than a career. It's a calling and a passion. Through the years, the League has provided me the tools I needed to navigate a dynamic landscape, helping orchestras shift, grow, and evolve. Tools like data, best practices, and insight. A network of colleagues I can call on for mutual support and advice, including many of you in the room and professional development that provides both technical knowledge and also personal growth. And it's been a great privilege to get to know the next generation of leaders through the League's Essentials of Orchestra Management program. And if you ever want to feel really inspired about the future of the field, just take a look at these incredible young people that the League is helping to develop. They are totally fired up and they're going to make a huge difference. So, and all of us have millions of reasons to say thank you to Heather and Nedjen, so thank you so much for all of your great work as well. In a recent survey, almost every orchestra in the country said that they had benefited significantly from the federal stimulus funds that the League helped advocate for. And those funds helped us retain our people, take care of our employees, and continue our performances and programmatic activity. That was very much the case for us in Atlanta. So I'll also remind you what we've heard a few times now during this conference, which is that the League's dues from member orchestras only pay for about a third of the cost of running the League. 
they raise $2 million more from donors like us. And it's the only way that they can continue providing these vital services to us. And just as for all of us, because of the impacts of the pandemic, it means that philanthropy is more important than ever. So it's really, let's dig deep. So I hope that every single one of you has made your gift already, if you haven't. You can go see the team on level two um, and get one of these beautiful tags. And uh, we'd really love for each of us to make a gift today. Even if it's a small gift, it makes a big difference. Um, so thank you so much and support the league. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful plea to donate. Um, I'm in, in a more tender moment of our, our uh, proceedings. Um, I'm Melanie Clark. I'm a board member of the League, and it brings me great joy to be with all of you. But we have all lost friends and colleagues during these past few years. And as Jesse's comments reminded us, we do all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. So to, right now, I'd like to take a moment to remember those members of the League of American Orchestras family who have passed away since we last gathered. Michael Morgan. Michael Morgan was a visionary and beloved conductor. He left an impact in Oakland that will never be forgotten. He was a frequent and enthusiastic participant in League conference sessions. Many people in this room worked closely with him and his passing left a huge void, not only in Oakland, but also in our field. In 1964, Barbara Tucker represented the Detroit Symphony as part of the League of American Orchestra's newly formed Volunteer Council. And she also served as the Volunteer Council President. Barbara was one of the original charter members of the League of American Orchestra's board. Ann Kunzman was the highly accomplished and spirited executive director of the Fort Worth Symphony. She transformed her orchestra and retu retired for a second time in 2011. She was president of the Regional Orchestra Managers Association and was a League board member in 1986. Very close to the hearts of the League staff is Chester Lane. He was the longtime editor of the Symphony Magazine and often was considered the face of the League. His wife, Marianne Schiolino, serves our field as an artist manager and we offer her our deepest condolences. The family welcomes any colleagues to a memorial service which will take place in person and will also be live streamed on Saturday, June 18th at 1 p.m. at St. Paul the Apostle Church in New York City. This past March, we suddenly and sadly lost Hugh Long, a life trustee of the Louisiana Philharmonic and my colleague and former league board member. His presence at our meetings is sorely missed by our board and especially by our staff, with whom he worked very closely to guide learning and leadership initiatives for our field. And finally, I want to remember Ann Parsons, another former League board member and the legendary executive director of the Detroit Symphony. Ann's extraordinary career touched many, and she exemplified the best in service and leadership to our field. I'd like to introduce Henry Fogel now. Um, he's the former president and CEO of the League of American Orchestras. He was a mentor to me in the Essentials program. And uh, Henry will now say some words about Anne. Or are you going to play the piano? <laughs> or the harpsichord? No, I'm not going to play. <laughs> I was offered my first executive director position at an orchestra, the National Symphony of Washington, in 1981, to start in July. Although in June I was still an employee of the New York Philharmonic, I attended the 1981 Dallas League Conference with my National Symphony hat on. That was the conference at the conclusion of the first year of the League's Management Fellowship Training Program. 
Peter Pastreich, the San Francisco Symphony Executive Director, who I considered then and considered today one of the smartest people I know, sought me out to say, I had this fellow in that program, a woman named Ann Parsons, one of the smartest young people I've ever encountered, you're going to the National Symphony. That place needs a complete rebuild. You need a good new staff. You should hire her. I said, fine. In the conference in Dallas that year at midnight, there was a water polo game between managers and fellows, after which Anne and I sat by the pool bar. I think whiskey sours was the drink of the choice that evening. And I said to her, I'm going to the National Symphony in August. They have fired the 10 previous executive directors over 30 years. <laughs> but it seems to me the capital of our country ought to have a good orchestra. And I'm going to take this on. I would love you to be my executive assistant. And this was after about a 40-minute conversation getting to know each other. I said, I can't give you a job description yet. I give you a kind of salary I have in mind. And I would need you to start a week after me because I don't even know where you would sit. <laughs> she already had three job offers. She turned to me and said, this sounds like fun. Yes. Anne had the poise, the quiet self-confidence of someone much older than the 23 years she was at that time. A few months after she started, I had to let my orchestra manager go, and I immediately decided I didn't need to do a search, and was a natural. My music director was the great Russian cellist and musician and conductor, Mr. Slav Rostropovich, but he was also a Russian male born in 1927. <laughs> and he said to me, Henrichka, you make big mistake. Orchestra manager must have balls. <laughs> I said, Slava, relax. She does. <laughs> A few weeks later, Anne stood up to him on some point, telling him he couldn't do something he wanted to do because it would have violated the musician's agreement. He railed and he pushed and he tried, and she kept in her very quiet way saying, I'm sorry, you, you, you can't do it. He shrugged, walked away, and the next day came to me and said, you're right, Anne has balls. <laughs> Within that first year, she had the love and the respect of every single board member, every staff member, and the musicians. In addition to intelligence, she had what I would call a quiet magnetism. Her calm demeanor actually hid a will of iron, but one never imposed with force. By her second year there, I had added to the staff an artistic administrator, another star of the first year of the fellowship program, Alison Volgamore. In the years I had together working with Anne, Alison, and Rostropovich <clears throat> remain the most fun I've ever had in this field. I remember one time writing a memo to the orchestra. I had not yet learned the lesson that I later learned, that written words do not have inflection and can be interpreted in many ways. Anne and Allison marched jointly into my office and said, Henry, you can't write this this way. This tone, it's terrible. I knew they were right. I told them so. I said I would, in fact, run all future memos to the orchestra by them before I sent them. Anne turned to me as they left and said, Henry, that's what you get when you hire a couple of tough broads. <laughs> when she left after three years, we had a farewell party, board, staff, and musicians. When I commented in my toast at Anne's remarkable poise for somebody at the age of 26 from the board members who didn't know her as well, there was an audible gasp. I was stunned. I have many memories of Anne. I could take hours, but I promise I won't. But I do have one I want to share with you. We were on an Asian tour starting in Japan. The very organized Japanese presenters had scheduled a meeting on our first morning in the hotel lobby to go over the schedule. Anne was our orchestra manager and set the tour schedule. I 
I, one thing I'm very good at is delegating. So I got out of the way. So she would say, okay, tomorrow morning the first bus leaves the hotel at 7.30. And the Japanese presenter would look at me and say, is that right, Mr. Fogel? And I would say, if Ms. Parsons says so, it is, because she set the schedule. That went on for about 20 minutes, at which point I pretended to need a bathroom break. I took Anne aside. I said, I'm going to appear to be sick. Don't worry, I'm fine. But I need to let them learn that they have to work with you. And so I'm getting out of the way. We're going to my room. I made my apologies. I did that. And they dealt with Anne, despite the fact that she was not the chief and that she was a woman in 1982 in Japan. It was not normal for female leadership in Japan in 1982. Well, it worked out so well that a couple of years later, Tom Morris hired her away from me for the same position at the Boston Symphony because his music director, Seiji Ozawa, had heard such raves of her ability from the Japanese music business. <laughs> you can't win. <laughs> Anne's passion for the art form was laid on top of her passion for the people who make the art. She understood that nobody ever buys a ticket to see us manage. Everything she did was underlined by Anne's fundamental humanity. I retained a relationship with her through the years. I remember the pain that she felt during the lengthy strike in Detroit. She knew that that orchestra had to reconfigure its business model and she knew it was going to be a painful, difficult, even ugly process. She knew she had to do it. The key thing to know about Ann Parsons is that not only did they have a strike, and not only did it end, and not only did she and the orchestra survive the strike, but she retained the love and admiration of the musicians of that orchestra, most of them at any rate, and was able to continue her position. I worked alongside many truly wonderful people in my 60 years in the music business. Many smart, thoughtful, passionate people. I will say to you that I have never come across Anne's combination of intellectual and emotional intelligence, passion, grace, humanity, strength, nobility, and empathy for everyone she worked with. I truly loved her. And like all of you, I will miss her terribly. Our world is a better place because Ann Parsons inhabited it. And I know that Simon has a very special announcement about a perfect way for remembering Ann Parsons. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Be beautiful words. Uh, very, very true. Um, and, you, you know, it was very poignant actually yesterday. Just we had such a great gathering of the Group 1 managers. We have a great presence of the Group uh, 1 CEOs here this year. And she was, her presence was missed. And nowhere more than in that group, in the room of uh, discussions around the challenges of running major orchestras, to, is, is Anne's presence more missed. And I was lucky enough to be um, a few weeks ago at a wonderful tribute concert that the, the Detroit Symphony put on uh, to her. And I know that the Detroit Symphony, that her, her legacy at the Detroit Symphony will live for a very, very long time. But we also think that it's appropriate to honor Anne on a national basis. Anne was known um, above all um, to so many people as, uh, as a mentor. She always had time for people and she always had time particularly for the women who, were, uh, who looked up to her and who admired her model. And so we're going to start, we're announcing it today, we'll have more details in the fall, but on the next slide here, if you just put that up, uh, we are launching the Ann Parsons Leadership Program, which is going to be a... Thank you. Which is, which is going to be a mentorship program um, for women and non-binary orchestra professionals, uh, honoring the spirit, humanity, generosity, and leadership of Anne Parsons. And the goal here is to advance the career of, of people in our profession, um, to provide them with men mentoring, to provide them with networks, 
Um, and it has another element that's really important here, which I think that Anne would really have approved of, which is what we would call a train the trainer uh, program, where we're actually going to uh, provide training to the, to the mentors who are going to, to help our mentees across the field, which is great because what we're really doing through this is we're building a culture of mentorship for women and non-binary leaders in our field. Uh, it's a really beautiful concept, and I think it's something that we're in here she would rejoice in. Um, we are fundraising for this program right now. A lot of people in this room have already told me they'd like to donate for it. So if, if, you, if you would like to give something, if you were close to Anne and you would like to support, help support this program, uh, please come directly to me. And uh, we will be rolling out more details in the fall. But it's a, I think it's a way to pay Anne a great tribute uh, on a national level. And she was a friend, and we truly miss her. So thank you very much for all your help on that. So that brings us to, thank you, thank you. So uh, that brings us to the end of the meeting. That brings us to the end of the luncheon. Thank you very much. I think we have another full packed afternoon. We have a wonderful concert tonight. I'm sure most everybody here is coming to the concert. And the party after the concert is going to be the big one. So get ready. Be there. See you later, everybody. Thanks for a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.